As a parent and a neuroscientist, I often find myself applying things that I learn from one aspect of my life into the other. This has especially been true in the last few months of working from home, when I often felt myself doing both at the same time. As the dad of a four going on 14 year old, one word that has lost almost all meaning in our household is no. It doesn't matter who's saying it, how many times it's said, or the tone it's said in, the results are often the same, complete indifference. This four year old who is, loves scary dinosaurs, there isn't really anything we can do in terms of adding fear to make him change his behavior. So what does that have to do with our topic today? Well, for the last 30 to 40 years, most of our campaigns around reducing substance use in adolescents have taken the same approach, starting from Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign to the Reefer Madness era, and then even more recently, trying to show graphic images of the potential effects of substance use. Even three days ago, we have this revision of the Just Say No campaign by the current first lady in the US. And just like saying no to the four-year-old, these approaches have largely not worked in producing behavioral change. So what does work? For that, we turn to another lesson in my parenting adventures. With two boys under the age of eight in our household, the most commonly used word is why. This can be heard when we ask them to do something. Between the two of them, in the form of, why are you staring at me? Why are you touching my things? And in the last few months, between my spouse and I, in the form of, why did we do this to ourselves? The why question is important for the adolescents who are now becoming emerging adults and are trying to make their decisions about their substance use, as well as for researchers like myself to help understand why or why not adolescents should or should not use drugs. And it's through campaigns that take the evidence from the research and then translate it to messaging for these adolescents, combined with equipping them with better social skills that we have actually been able to bring down the rates of substance use in adolescents. Here is the data from Ontario, where we see consistent declines in the use of tobacco and alcohol in the adolescent or the high school going population. The results for cannabis are similar, but we see recent flutter possibly due to legalization, and so we will see what happens in the coming years. These data are largely consistent with data from the US as well, where we see consistent declines in the rates of alcohol and tobacco use in high school students. But not, is all, not all is heading in this direction. The rates of e-cigarette use, or vaping as it's called, are actually increasing. And so here we see in the last year in Ontario almost a doubling of the rates of e-cigarette use in adolescents. In fact, before the COVID epidemic or pandemic, what we were hearing on the media was about the vaping epidemic. That these rates can also be seen in the US with the single two largest increases in recent history observed in the vaping of nicotine or THC, which is the primary constituent of the cannabis plant or the psychoactive constituent of the cannabis plant. Why have there been increases in vaping? We don't exactly know. But some reasons might be either related to the perceived lack of harm with these e-cigarettes. And while that is very true for smokers who now quit their combustible tobacco and move to these electronic nicotine devices, it's not necessarily true for adolescents that were never smokers to begin with. And as far as for being safer than cigarettes goes, that's not exactly a high bar. So it's important for us to figure out why else have these caught on so prevalently in this population. One reason might be the use of influencer, social media influencer based marketing, or some misinformation that might exist about the contents of these e-cigarettes. 
I remember giving a talk now three years ago at a sorority at Dartmouth College where I did my postdoc. And while the talk was about alcohol and cannabis use, all of the questions that I got after the talk were about juuling. At that time, I didn't even know what juuling was. And so when I asked them, what is juuling? They told me, these are these flavor pods that you can use and vaporize just like e-cigarettes that don't have any nicotine in them. Unfortunately, that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, some of these pod devices have more nicotine than the earlier e-cigarette devices. And that's when I realized that we had a need for greater information and dissemination of that information, as well as more research related to why do adolescents find these, the use of these e-cigarettes so rewarding and appealing. Since e-cigarettes, and especially use during adolescence, is relatively recent, we don't have a lot of data around the long-term effects of this use during adolescence. What we do know so far is that adolescents who use e-cigarettes are more likely to use other drugs, like alcohol or opiates. In addition to that, they are more likely to go on to develop cannabis use or combustible tobacco use. And lastly, these individuals are more likely to have ADHD, PTSD, gambling disorder, and anxiety. And those domains or these effects are largely consistent with what we know about the effects of substance use on the adolescent brain. Previous studies have shown that the risk of substance use during adolescence usually manifests itself in a change in the risk trajectory and results in three domains, cognitive deficits, the risk for substance use, which we know that the earlier you start using substances, the more your risk of substance use disorders later on in life, and then lastly, the risk for mental illness. The problem with these studies is that they're association studies, where we don't know whether the substance use actually causally contributes to the development of these three domains. It's a chicken or egg question that science struggles with. And we, including our own lab, are trying to answer this question. One example of this might be the relationship between adolescent cannabis use and schizophrenia. While adolescent cannabis use, especially early on and of higher potency cannabis, is considered a risk factor for the development of schizophrenia, the high rates of cannabis use in patients with schizophrenia make it difficult to assess whether it was the schizophrenia or the risk for it that gave rise to the cannabis use or whether it was the cannabis use that gave rise to the schizophrenia. The same might be true for e-cigarettes as well. Maybe the individuals that were going to go on to develop the cannabis use disorder or combustible tobacco use were the same people that ended up using e-cigarettes. And it was a third factor that was either related to their genetics or environment that gave rise to both things. And that is where preclinical animal-based studies come in. They help us answer what the causal influence of adolescent substance use on the brain is and what the changes that happen as a result of it and at the same time control for those confounding factors that might come from genetic or environmental influence. And I am not by any means the first person to think of doing these studies in animals to get at the causal basis. In fact, we stand on the shoulders of giants, giants like Linda Speer and others who have laid the groundwork and set up a solid foundation for us to stand on. They have established what age in rodents is equivalent to that age in humans. They have established what changes happen in the brain in adolescence, in animals, and whether those are in fact consistent with the changes observed in the humans. Because if those changes were not consistent, these studies wouldn't be of much value. And then lastly, they have helped establish what is happening at the level of the neurochemicals within the brain these chemicals that are responsible for all communication within the brain, is there something happening during adolescence? And have shown that adolescence is a period of considerable flux. This figure that you see behind me is meant to be small for a reason and difficult to see. 
the point that you're supposed to take from here is that across all the different chemical messengers within the brain, during adolescence, there is some flux in those systems. Either they're going up or going down or doing both at the same time. And so when substances are used during this period, they interact with these fluctuations to possibly produce long-term changes. And for those of us that are dealing with either teenagers at home or are young enough to remember being a teenager, this figure probably also explains a lot. And so today, since the topic of the day is intended to innovate, I wanted to highlight some ways in which our group and others are bringing innovation to this topic. While most of the previous studies that test the effects of drugs on the adolescent brain in animals have used injected models of delivery, that's not exactly how the humans use the drugs. And so we have been working towards establishing routes of delivery that are more similar to the used, those used in adolescence. And so one way we've done that is by creating open source devices that allow us to expose animals to the vapor from those same jewel pods that those students were asking me about a few years ago. And we've made some important discoveries with this along the way as well. Like a recent paper showing that adolescents are in fact more vulnerable because they find the vapor from those nicotine jewel devices more rewarding compared to adults. We're also experimenting with other routes of administration, like edibles, not us, but with the animals, obviously. Um, but in addition to that, we are now combining these with studies of the brain circuitry to be able to get at what are those causal changes in the brain that happen as a result of adolescent substance use. And for that, we use magnetic resonance imaging-based studies of the brain, which are akin to those done in humans. And through this, we can identify exactly the changes that happen in those humans that could be contributed directly to the substance use during adolescence. With the hope of identifying those inflection points in those risk trajectories that I was talking about earlier, and someday through manipulating these circuits, maybe reverse or prevent the effects of adolescent exposure to substances. In the end, I'll come back to where I started. As, I, as a parent, I will continue to have the frank discussions of the why of substance use with my children early and often. And as a neuroscientist, I promise to continue giving talks like this to equip other parents with the why so that they can have these important conversations with their kids.